Good evening. Thank you all for coming out and braving the slip and slide out there. It's just so treacherous. Um, I'm Bob Jolly. I'm the director here. And we are really pleased to have you here. Great turnout. We always wonder, like, how's the publicity going? And apparently, well. <clears throat> um, in just a minute, I'll introduce Ed Baer. First, I want to mention the sponsors for this series and some upcoming events. Uh, this is the, art, the first uh, lecture in the two, 2014 uh, Arts and Culture series. Um, this is really our homegrown series where we feature our renowned and local talent. If you or friends of yours are uh, makers of art things, um, poets, writers, thinkers, etc., we are looking for people to populate this series. We do nine lectures a year. and. These are uh, the people who live among us, and we're really proud to have uh, conversations with each other. We are exceptionally lucky to have sponsors for this series. We are very thankful to series underwriters Mary Lou and Philip Meyer, Friends of the Athenaeum. Speaker support comes from the Friends of the Athenaeum. When you buy a book at Secondhand Prose or donate a book to Secondhand Prose, become a member of the Friends. You are helping the Friends support the Athenaeum, and we really appreciate that. Um, if you bake a pie, because in September we'll be calling, or you buy a pie, and you'll see them, um, that all goes to support the Friends, and they support programming here at the Athenaeum. They are great supporters of our programming. This particular talk is supported by me and my brothers Michael and David in memory of our mother, Georgette Jolly, who passed away in December. It was a long, hard winter for, for me personally. And we are, uh, I and my brothers are really proud to support this program and really proud to have, uh, be sponsors of Ed Bear's talk tonight. A couple of, um, a couple of upcoming events. <clears throat> On February 5th, we have our next Vermont Humanities Council first Wednesday lecture featuring Eugene Uman, artistic director of the Vermont Jazz Center. And he will be speaking on the life and times of Thelonious Monk Anybody here Monk fan, a Monk fan? He's one of the great 20th century jazz pianists, one of the great 20th century jazz artists, and a, and a quirky personality. If that's your cup of tea, he is an amazing person to watch, and you can see plenty of YouTube videos about him. Um, this should be a fantastic talk where we'll hear Monk music and have somebody explain the nature of monk music. It's, it's very, uh, a very different kind of piano playing. He would do a little dance sometime when he was playing. He's an amazing character, deceased, an amazing person. Um, so that should be a fantastic talk. Uh, the first Wednesdays are always on the first Wednesday. <laughs> the arts and culture series are on the second Wednesday. You see where I'm going here. When we do the um, readings in the gallery series, it's on the third Wednesday. For some of you who are my age, Prince Spaghetti Day, Wednesday, it's program day here at the Athenaeum. Um, our next arts and culture event is Wednesday, February 12th. Jose Benitez and Bob Jenks will discuss the art and craft of fashion, product, and portrait photography. Bob Jenks of the Three Generation Jenks Studio, one of our local um, arts, uh, our arts makers, and, and a long, having a long history here. Um, after the talk tonight, Ed has books for sale. The library has the book to check out. Those of you who just want to read it, it's here. Those of you who want to buy it, there are many copies there that will be available. A terrific book, 50 Foods, it's, it's apples to, what's the V? Walnuts. Well, w, walnuts. No Z, apples to walnuts, and a lot of terrific things in between. To our speaker, internationally renowned food and wine expert Ed Beer is the author of The Artful Eater, The Art of Eating Cookbook, Recipes from the First 25 Years, and 50 Foods, The Essentials of Good Taste. 
He is the editor and publisher of The Art of Eating, a magazine that first appeared in 1986. The Art of Eating is about the best food and wine, what they are, how they are produced, where to find them. Sometimes we present the most cutting edge cooking, but more often than not, the best food and wine are traditional, created when people had more time and food, and food was more central to happiness than it is today. We believe in simplicity on the farm and in workshops and kitchens. What's treated least usually tastes best. We believe that old or new, the best food and wine have a sense of place that comes from soil, climate, tradition, and all the local influences that a group, that as a group exists nowhere else. We had a talk here last week, it was the first Wednesday talk, and when the talk was over, some people were lingering and they saw the sign for this talk, and it was a younger couple, and they were sort of like the FFV, the Future Farmers of Vermont, and they said, oh, who's that man, Ed Beer? What's that gonna be about? And I was explaining as best I could just to tell them who Ed was and, and why they should know who he is. And they, after my explaining this, they said, is it about organic food? And I said, well, some of it, probably. Um, interestingly to me, they represented the local VOR movement in, in a great example, and also to the degree where there was a sort of excessive focus on if it's organic, it's better than if it's local, and it's in your place. So it was an interesting little discussion about, they kind of thought, well, if it's organic, they might be here. I don't think they're actually here. <laughs> Didn't think of that. <laughs> I guess I wasn't much of a salesman in that regard. <laughs> Ed Beer has taught writing at the University of Vermont, served on the first international jury for the Slow Foods Award, and speaks internationally on food and culture. He has been featured in publications ranging from the New York Times and the Atlantic to Forbes and the Financial Times. He writes and publishes from the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, where he lives with his wife, Kimberly, and two stepsons, Maximilian and Zane. And just before he comes up, and this is just an aside, how, how is the sound in here? I never take enough time to actually say, does it sound reasonably good? You can hear it in the back, it's not fuzzy, it's not. It, you'd like it a little louder? Let's see, if I go a little closer, even that can help. That, that better? So here I am, Ed, like that far away. Here is Ed Beer to talk to us. Thank you. It's kind of funny to feel in intimidated because there's this giant painting and this full room and this great gallery and I've hardly ever, maybe never been in here at night and seen that the light is so flattering and it's so atmospheric. I hardly know where to begin. Um, I think we're in a dairy state. What passes for a dairy state? Because I say that only because there's so much less than there was. And I thought I would, even though this isn't a reading, I thought I would read a couple of short passages that express the essence of the book that I've just finished. And I say just finished. It wasn't that long ago because down to the last desperate minute I was revising. So it was one of the last, the, the, the distance between publication date and last scribbling was very possibly record short for the, this day and age. The first one I want to read about is Camembert, which is such a symbol. Camembert can seem less a food that exists than one that lives in the imagination or perhaps memory. Of course, it does exist, and in very large quantities. One million camemberts are said to be eaten each day in France, but can you find one with the taste evoked by the name? Wherever you live, ask your cheesemonger what's really good right now, and the chances are almost zero that he or she will answer camembert. When I called one of the more serious US retailers and tried to order one, the closest they could come was a ripe coulumier, which is a larger, thicker cheese from a different part of France. I turned to a cheese book by an important London seller with good access to French cheeses to see what she had to say, and she said nothing whatsoever about Camembert. She left it out. Twenty years ago, when Pierre Boisard published a widely noticed book, Le Camembert, Mythe National, he found only a single true artisan making the cheese. The large-scale producers had taken over, the tail end of a long process. 
Today, like many cheeses, Camembert is covered with an all-white laboratory strain of Penicillium candidum mold. And where, there, where many French cheeses at their best are made from raw milk on farms, almost all Camembert is made from pasteurized milk with an emphasis on control, safety, and durability. The most industrial Camembert has a thick plastic texture and a boring, invariable taste. The poet Léon Paul Fargue famously compared Camembert with the feet of God. But too often now, his feet are very clean. <laughs> and yet some producers do use raw milk. Some large producers have a more handcrafted line. And even some pasteurized Camembert is made using relatively craft-like methods. It's possible to find a good, well-ripened cheese. There's a little bit of a strain in me of debunking. And <clears throat> which is not to say there isn't great ideal cheese out there. There's a little, a little bit of that debunking, however, in the, uh, the next one I'm reading in my dairy theme evening, which is about Roquefort. This, the chapter is Roquefort and other blue cheeses, but everything turns on the one cheese. Roquefort, the classic blue cheese from, from used milk, aged in the caves of the village of Roquefort sur Suzon in the south of France, has been made since at least the 11th century, although it isn't clear it was always a blue cheese. A well-made Roquefort offers an unusual combination of intensity and refinement, a sweet piquancy mingled with spice. Compared with cow's and goat's milk, used milk is higher in protein and much higher in fat and it gives a lighter texture to Roquefort. And used milk contributes its own different flavors as the cheese ages. The appellation, the first for any food or drink in France, established in 1925, embraces a vast area. The heart of it, closest to the village, consists of limestone plateau ringed with cliffs and covered in shallow soil. Summers are hot and dry. Very little will grow there. Almost the only activity is raising sheep. Nearly 2,000 farms milk a total of 750,000 ewes of the native Lacon breed in a season that commonly runs from mid-December through mid-July. The cheeses are aged in caves built into the fractured rock beneath the village at the edge of the Combalou Plateau. By way of fissures, called fleurines, a continuous supply of moist, cool air passes through the caves. In most of them, the temperature remains between 46 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit, hardly varying more than a degree or two year round. The best caves are the most humid. Roquefort today has seven producers, the largest of which is Société, responsible for multiple brands and more than two thirds of total production. All the cheese is made in dairy plants, eight of them, from small and manual to large and industrial, located from about five to about 35 miles outside the village. The total area that produces milk for the cheese is so large and geographically diverse, some is more mountainous, cooler, and wetter, that any uniqueness compared with other blue cheeses can come only from the caves and the particular blue molds found there, strains of Penicillium roqueforti. This book, which was my brilliant idea, is unique in that, at least among recent books, it has no recipes, and it's a book about the broad appreciation of food. That was my idea of a niche. And, and then I worked on the book for about 10 years. Uh, and sometime early in the fall, I said to myself, this really is an unusual book. And I tried to think, and then I began to look on my shelves to see what other books preceded it that were just like it, which were books really about connoisseurship. And I found two books, both British, one published in 1927 and one in 1937 one by um, P. Morton Shand, who also was a wonderful apple connoisseur. And that was the one in 1927, A Book of Food. And the other was The Epicure's Companion by Edward and Lorna Bunyard. That was published in 1937. He was the great, um, 
the greatest, probably the greatest nurseryman of the 20th century. He was a huge connoisseur of apple, but all kinds of fruit varieties too. Look, there's a little apple theme there. And there was nothing else from 1937 to 2013 <laughs> that was a really just a broad book about the connoisseurship of food, a book about eating. And, and sometimes I can say uh, in an update in the last uh, couple of months since the book came out, it was a problem because you couldn't get on the list of 10 best cookbooks because there wasn't even a recipe to give somebody, you know, not one recipe to give somebody an excuse to call it a cookbook. However, it was reviewed as a wine book because there are notes on wine by the wine uh, critic of the San Francisco Chronicle, which was a, a, a great honor and pleasure and surprise. Um, the idea, well, in the, in the Art of Eating, in the magazine and, and and before that, when it was a newsletter from the very start, it was always to get at the essence of the thing. Um, kind of a theme was authenticity, which in the food world has become fraught because people say, oh, what's, what's authentic? You know, what time are you talking about? This recipe, well, who cooked it and where? And, and so it's a word I've kind of abandoned, but, but it, it expresses what I've always been looking for. And, 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 and the essence of the food is the beginning, is, is the way each of the 50 chapters begins, is to get at the, the essence of it. The big question that I'm always asked is why 50 foods? And um, it's such an obvious question. And then, of course, it's why these 50 foods. But why 50 foods? Well, it took me 10 years to write, which was really a process of, of, of accumulating questions, the things I needed to answer, accumulating information, creating all kinds of files, deciding which foods, back to which 50, which foods were in and out. Um, and so that was 10 years, and really what it what you want probably to sell a lot of books is, is 100 foods, but I never would have finished the book. So that's the, sh <laughs> the short answer to the question of why 50 is that I could only do 50. And I toyed with the idea of, this is making me bend over. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, I toyed with the idea of 67 foods <laughs> or something completely eccentric. But I realized that really wasn't a very saleable thing either. Um, and 50 just was, was a doable number. It, 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 gives, it gives enough uh, breadth so you can talk about you know, six or eight of everything, whether it's fruits or vegetables or meats or fish, um, <clears throat> and include oddities that don't quite fit in, like honey or olive oil. Um, so I think, that, I, think, I think in the end, why 50 foods is, is that it's alliterative and, and doable. Um, the other question, why these 50 foods, is almost a, stum almost a stumbling block for me because I want to say at times, well, that's really such an obvious, such a normal question, but it's such an uninteresting question. Um, of the 50 foods, something like 35 or 40 are kind of more or less unarguable. I mean, beef, lamb, I don't know, apples, uh, cod, which of course is fish that's suffered a number, and isn't as important as it was, but it's one of the great, the great fish, um, and was used to be in vast numbers, and was arguably responsible for first drawing people to North America. Um, so there are these unarguable 35 or 40 things. And then nobody wants to read an encyclopedia. Nobody wants to read anything written from an encyclopedic point of view. Not very much they don't. I mean, the, 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 I, I'm, very good at running down side paths, but I always think of you know, the early Encyclopedia Britannicas where the entries were signed and you had a sense of a person being behind and actually a point of view. Um, so the last 10 to 15 all represent my point of view, my idea of what, what, makes, uh, what, what might belong in a group of 50. Um, thus you would have, now I'm going to draw a complete blank, but uh, somebody would probably put out caviar, but to me caviar stood as a symbol of something uh, very essential. Um, I almost put in quince. That's not an example. So I'll draw a blank now that I'm in front of you. But um, there, there are there are blue blue crab would be a good example. Um, and then the ne the next thing is that so so you, so I think the, the the essence of the book is that it has a point of view and it's much more interesting. And who wants to read it? Uh, an encyclopedia. The next thing, of course, if you've looked at the list, is why are there six cheese plus cheeses plus butter and uh, cream? And the answer of course, is is really the same, partly the same. It's those are cheeses that mean those are foods that mean so much to me. But it's also that 
Um, to, to paraphrase Patience Gray, who's a great and wonderful writer about food, cheese is the greatest food as wine is the greatest drink. It has that, the, the element of age and all the variables. Um, the element of age introduces a, level, a degree of complexity because it magnifies. And cheese has um, a quality more than almost more than any other food I can quickly think of, and probably more than any other food, period, where tiny variables in the making produce enormous uh, magnified results in, in the finished cheese so that you, know, you, you heat the milk to a certain temperature, you add so much salt, you add so much um, rennet, you, um, you, you, you age it at a certain temperature. Um, the milk comes from this species of animal, this breed of animal. Um, they're in this kind of uh, location up on a cool mountainside or they're in the hot plains of Provence um, near the mouth of the Rhone River. Um, all those, all those many things. The um, the time you the time you wait before you uh, spoon the curd, ladle the curd into the molds. How how much you break up the the curd when you're doing it. How long you 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 leave it to drain before you turn it out. Um, how often you turn the cheese once it's out. When, when you salt it and how much salt and where you put it and so on. And whether you put it in a brine, on and on and on. Um, to go with those cheeses, I have three breads, which is one of the other, to me, very interesting things that came up after I finished writing the book. Because, I don't know how many of us are living up here are aware of it, but out in the big world, bread doesn't automatically appear on a restaurant table as much as it used to do. And sometimes they charge for it. And in fact, in today's New York Times, uh, no, sorry. Um, it was Adam Richmond who writes for GQ or something. He reviewed a, a restaurant up the Hudson Valley where he was charged $8 for the, for the bread, whatever they called it, the bread bowl. And he was completely appalled. And then they had some little spread with it. And then they charged him an extra $2. So as he said, he was up into, into double digits for bread. Um, so <sighs> bread was the staff of life. Bread was, was in the West, but I think right. It, into parts of Asia, um, uh, almost a symbol for food. It was the foundation of everything we ate. When the Mediterranean diet and Italian food came so much into vogue, be vogue people began to think of pasta as being kind of a es essential Mediterranean food, and it is. But not because people ate it that much, because they couldn't afford to eat it. The wonderful thing about bread was, I always think, that it was portable. Um, you know, there, there weren't, if you, up until 1960, 60% of Italians worked in agriculture bef because of the system of tenant farming, the Mezzadria. And that fell apart very rapidly in just a few years as things like the fiat factories took off. But uh, there was, you, you had to be able to walk out into the fields and take your lunch. And what were you going to do? Take wet wet leftover pasta when you didn't have saran wrap. I mean, it's really very fundamental, I think, why there was bread it kept. You didn't have, you know, pasta was, was a food of feast days. There were people who had it not even once a week, but maybe only on the most important feast days of the year in Italy. Um, bread could be baked once a day, but you could be on a farm and you could bake it once a week or once every two weeks or even once a month, and in exceptional cases, even less often than that. Um, and it was always there, and so much old European cooking involves old bread, stale bread, pain rasi. Um, so in my book, there are three breads. One is the emblematic bread of all time, which is the, the country loaf, the, um, what I call big bread, but gros pain, which to, was one French name for it, but so often it just was bread. It had no name wherever, it, wherever you were, it was just bread. And the other is, is uh, the archetype of sort of modern eating, which is the baguette. And the last is, um, is rye bread, which is the least, the, the, the hardest bread to find well made in North America. Um, I can go down a side path, but maybe I'll go come back to it <laughs> and finish summing up the book. Um, and then the other thing that's in, in the book is, is notes on wine <clears throat> whenever they're <clears throat> whenever whenever they're relevant. So um, I haven't often been asked, but I always feel as if people are really asking, why is there wine in a book about food? And first, of course, there are people who really love wine, and they would argue that wine is food in its traditional role in diet, which is true. 
also, when you eat, so this is a book about connoisseurship. So connoisseurship, <coughs> connoisseurship is about learning. And you learn about food and about the taste of food by eating. As, you, as, as somebody once said, three chances a day, but fanatical people when they travel, fanatical food lovers when they travel have been known to sneak in an extra meal. Uh, so each time you, 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 you taste, you, you're learning. Hopefully you're tasting fresh things and learning more faster. But wine it provides an interaction. So you're tasting the food, you're tasting the wine, you're tasting the interaction between the two. To, so at the risk of oversimplification, you're kind of doubling the rate of your speed of learning. Um, and there are, I think I'm kind of a harsh critic of, of the wine and food thing. That is, I think there's no better drink with food. But I think the times when there's a wine that goes with the food so well that there's a kind of a special synergy is extremely rare. Uh, sometimes they're at odds. Most of the time, they kind of get along. And sometimes they get along pretty well. That is, they, one doesn't hide the other, but they kind of coexist very nicely. Um, and then very exceptionally, there's, there, there's, there's synergy. But even when they just kind of get along, they're telling you a little something about each other. This is also a very Western, a very European book, though it was called to my attention. There are things like, again, the blue crab, which you can't, this is a species that doesn't exist in Europe. <laughs> but it, it's, um, and again, I think the reason for that is that it expresses my point of view. It certainly expresses the thing I know about. And this leads us, leads me, at least, when I'm asked about this, into this whole question of of modern food, which I've just written a long article about, which is going to go to press very shortly, um, and where we're going, where modern food is going, and what the food will be like that we eat at home, as opposed to restaurant food, because really when I talk about restaurant, when I say modern food, I'm thinking of restaurant food, because that's where the changes happen most quickly. And because now I think the way we eat at home is so much more influenced by restaurant food um, than it ever was in the past. It used to be really the reverse. If you went to a great Michelin star restaurant in France, you could, be, you could count on having home cooked local dishes rendered impeccably. That wasn't the only thing on the menu, but that was always present on the menu. Um, and, and that relationship of, of, home, of professional cooks drawing from home cooks has been largely reversed, and now home cooks are drawing from professional cooks, which does lead one to, to wonder when you hear about a great Italian chef, say, just to think of an um, example I was reading about recently, saying, oh, yes, this is everything I, everything I do. You know, some guy in his 40s, at, in his prime, uh, cooking at the um, Francescana in Modena, whose name I can't remember. Um, everything is drawing on the cooking of my grandmother. But pretty soon, you know, his grandchildren, the, the, uh, the, generations, the generation of his grandchildren won't have those grandparents. So then one wonders, where, you know, where, what happens with that changed relationship? But that's sort of a, a speculative, restaurant-oriented kind, kind of question. Um, and the, the, I, just before I, I, I leave the topic of what's in the book, the thing I would like to stress is that the most important thing whenever you're eating, even though this is a book of my opinions, which I hope you'll pay great attention to, um, everything turns on your own palate. If you can't trust your own palate, you're kind of lost. You're completely at sea. So, so, so there's a, 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 a current, a, a, a wonderful kind of balance between a skepticism of one's own inclinations, but faith in them. And, and, and a skepticism towards what you learned, toward, toward received knowledge, with, with, with a certain degree of respect for, for it as well, a balance. 50 Foods um, is not a book of stories. It's, it's a really practical how-to book. But it's all based on experiences, kind of things that, the stories that I wrote in The Art of Eating. And I think, thought I would tell you one sticking to the, the dairy theme. There's uh, another, another semi-mythical cheese, but not nearly well known as Camembert, in the north uh, west of Italy, in Piedmont, in the, uh, the same big region where uh, Barolo wine is made, which is arguably the greatest Italian wine. And Castelmagno cheese is a blue cheese, except it's not a blue cheese. If you ever have it in a restaurant, the chances are it will just be a very white cheese. 
And the reason is that historically, you know, uh, Roquefort is stabbed with 32 needles. And they were, before they had them all in one, you know, group, <laughs> now part of a machine, there, there were tools that were like an ice pick. There was just one needle at a time. But before there was even the single needle, they were blue cheeses, and they turned blue when they cracked open and some air got in, and they turned blue on their own. And Castelmagno, although the appellation allows you to stab the cheese, the maker, to, the ager, to stab the cheese, I've never seen that. It's a cheese that is still allowed to go blue when it, when it, when it will, will turn blue. So I was in, P in P Piedmont, and I went to see a guy named Beppe Cola, who was head of a Barolo producer named Prunotto up until the 80s, I think. Um, and it, it was dominant and great in its time, not to say that any one producer is the greatest, but it, it was dominant in its time, and he retired. And he, he's one of those people who just, nothing is ever good enough for him, and his standards are incredibly high. So I went to Bebe Cola, and we were talking about wine, <clears throat> and then I was going to milk him, to use an appropriate metaphor. Uh, for, for what he knew about food, and, and particularly Castelmagno. And I asked him about Castelmagno, and he immediately turned around and asked me a question. He said, well, what is Castelmagno like? And I was, you know, he's a strong personality, and I had no particular answer. Um, and, and, he's, and he basically told me what I told you. It's a very white cheese. He said, essentially, he told me, not essentially, I mean, really, he just told me Castelmagno doesn't exist. So I think it was on a, the next time I went to Piedmont, I had done some research and I learned about it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Castelmagno comes from the Valle Grana, which is way high up, and it's an area of Alpejo, which is um, alpine pasture. And it's a very isolated area. There's actually no town in the Valle Grana. Um, there's, I'm sorry, there are towns up there, but there's no town of, called Castelmagno. There's the, a last village called Chiapi, which is at 1,661 meters, which is pretty high. That's the last town. And somehow, I've forgotten how, but I got in touch with a guy named Cesare Eandi, who was a uh, long, hippie-ish kind of black hair, uh, but, but yeah, I don't know, probably in his late 30s then. And he was kind of the spokesperson. I don't remember what his job, what, what his official position was in relation to the cheese, but he was kind of the, the he was the marketing guy, let's call him. And uh, he, he, he was clearly an old communist. He was driving a Soviet Jeep, um, which, which, which you knew it, it just, you knew it was a Soviet Jeep. It rode rough, it went boom, 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 but it wouldn't quit. Um, and so I was up in the mountains with him. And he had actually come there because he, during that, Vietnam War period, he had been a uh, conscientious objector or whatever, refused to go into the Italian army, and they had sent him up into the mountains to uh, work with the poor, and so, I've forgotten exactly, but do some kind of social work, and then he had stayed on. And he was working with the cheese. Um, so Cesare took me around, and we went to see interesting people high up in the mountains, and, and it's just stunningly beautiful. And, uh, the pastures go all the way up to the very top, where I mean the, the peak, where and and you know, where the mountains go down the other side, and and they all the cows have bells, and they're the white Piemontese breed, as I recall, the Piemontese. I hope I'm not misspeaking, um, and. It's, you just can't believe how isolated and, and beautiful is it, it is. And we went to see cheesemakers producing that very white cheese, and I tasted the cheese, and it was perfectly fine, but not special. So it seemed as if uh, Bebe Colo was right. And then, um, somehow, I've forgotten how, I heard about the, the Stagionatura di Val Casotto, which is another, another high valley, um, not too, too far away. And Stagionatura means aging place. Um, uh, and um, there was another guy named Andrea Borgna, and his father had started this business. So I went up there to see the cheeses um, in, in what was kind of like a, a general store with, you know, I don't know, a few milk and cleaning products or something on a shelf. Uh, still, uh, in, the, in this village where absolutely nothing was happening, but in winter there was skiing not too far away, which is too bad probably for cheese making and, and cattle. Uh, and down into the earth, there were le floors, layers of um, 
cellar with cheeses, I can't remember, six or eight, and we were down in there, and all of a sudden there's an old lady in black, and there's his mother just sitting in a chair. Um, uh, and he had um, all these cheeses of the area. Uh, the, the big town around there is Bra, which is where um, Slow Food is, which was a trading center in the valley, and there's uh, Bra is the name of a cheese, and there's a Rasquera, which this guy pronounced a Rasquera. Um, and, and there was other things, including um, Castelmagno. So he takes me to the front where the store is, and he, and, and, and he um, gives me cheese to eat. And these cheeses are very, the crust is very different from any cheese I have ever seen anywhere else. It's kind of brown, and it's not too hard. It's kind of soft. And he barely took any of that crust away. He didn't waste it. And I saw that elsewhere in Piedmont. The only place I've ever seen where people would take hard cheeses and not remove the rind. And the rind wasn't bad. And he had Castelmagno that wasn't white. It was kind of a yellowy, dirty, creamy color. And it was blue. And it was incredibly good. So that was my revelation. So <clears throat> I took a big piece of, of Castelmagno and I went to see Bebe Cola. <laughs> And I was feeling pretty cool because um, I know he didn't think I would ever find that cheese. And he was impressed. And he, he tasted it. And he said, it was good. He said, I have just a little criticism. <laughs> it's a little too mature. And there's a little bitterness in the aftertaste. But he went and he, he, um, he went and he, uh, I've forgotten, he went, he, he organized great dinners for wine and food, and he went uh, and he ordered two cheeses like this. And then in turn, Andrea Borgna uh, at the Stagionatura went to the farmer. There was a particular farmer who had made those cheeses, and he ordered something like a dozen more cheeses directly from the farmer. So that cheese, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure how it thrives at present, but it's certainly out there. Um, and, and it's not going to disappear, uh, but it's still a cheese very few Italians have ever tasted, and yet it's one, within, within the world of Italian gastronomy, it's one of the most famous of all cheeses. That's the end of my cheese story. I can talk about all kinds of things. I can go back and talk about baguettes as opposed to big round loaves. I can talk about all kinds of things if anybody wants to point me in a direction. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, madame. Um, well, the wonderful thing, I feel like Pepe Cola. I'm thinking, oh, I'm just gonna. OK, so if Pepe Cola were to take on baguette, the first thing, the thing that would most offend him is the idea of a sourdough baguette. Because sourdough is, is a, a, because of the acidity, it makes tough crust. So it's something you absolutely don't want to have in a long, narrow shape. You want to have it in a big, round shape. You, not, the crust is good. It's protective. But um, so the first thing is that a baguette is made with commercial yeast. So it can't be very old. It has to be a modern bread. It has to be a little bit like camembert, which is also a modern cheese, though it's a 19th century cheese, late 19th century cheese. For camembert, you need the railroad to Paris. You need um, a, a larger scale production of milk, so you need more efficient cows. You need uh, marketing, so you need the, the wonderful little wooden box. You need um, the colorful label. And you need that white mold on the surface, which looks um, more hygienic and modern and very appealing. And then you need the, you need the Parisians to buy it. For the baguette, you also kind of need the Parisians to buy it. The baguette is a Parisian bread. Uh, because it's long and narrow, it goes stale. So you have to have a bakery nearby. You can't be on a farm somewhere and baking twice a week or going into town and getting it from a village baker or being part of a communal oven that's only fired once or twice, uh, once a week or every two weeks. You have to be able to buy the baguette two or three times a day, because even the best baguette, at the very maximum, might last 15 hours, and nobody makes baguette that well. They really last, well, a good one lasts, I don't know, six, eight hours to be really good at most. Uh, we, we get baguette here that in, at the St. J Food Co-op that should be pretty good, but they're baked at the crack of dawn in Waitsfield or somewhere, and they're not, by the time we get there, we get them, they're not so good. Um, you need, um, so let's go back. Let's go back to the big round loaf. The big round loaf, until the advent of the baguette, and even into the 1930s, was French bread to the French. 
The, the long loaf that you carry under your arm, which is to us is the emblem of French bread and probably is now to, 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 to the French, and, and they've largely forgotten. Um, the, when I used to go around and ask, sorry, I got too many thoughts and they're not organized here. When I used to go around in, in the 80s and 90s and I would go around to the French countryside and I would ask people, when did you see your first baguette? For some people it was the 1970s. So the bread went from Paris and then it would go to Lyon and other big cities and eventually it would make its way to the countryside. You need uh, commercial yeast, so that's late 19th century at the very earliest. Um, you need uh, wealthy people in the city to buy it several times a day. Uh, you need obviously the this, this, this skilled maker, you need the long narrow shape, you need a large plentiful supply of white flour, which in France actually began in the late, uh, late 18th century with Mutuo Economique. Um, and I think you really need a country, which is France, which has a fanatical appreciation of wheat. And I don't think there's any other country that you could argue has as great an appreciation for wheat. The other country that was early, early on had, had very good um, white wheat bread was Hungary. Uh, but, but when the French were doing their Mutuo Economique with, I'm not sure what all it involved, but stone milling and, and some degree of mechanized uh, bolting to remove the, the bran, the Hungarians were still sh sifting, it, sifting the bran out, so that wasn't going to go anywhere. Uh, the whole idea of the big loaf is that it keeps, um, and, and thus the idea is um, not the fresh flavor, but really the aged flavor. And when I would ask those same people, uh, when did you see your first baguette, I would ask, how fresh do you like your bread? And, and most of those people didn't like a fresh country loaf. They liked the taste after a day or more. And as, one, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a now dead but famous French chef once said to me, uh, his mother would never let them eat bread when they were fresh bread when they were little. And, and, and why? They were poor. And the answer she said was, no, you'll eat too much. <laughs> Which is a little bit different from why I think that they didn't eat the, the the, the round loaf. I think part of the problem was in the old days, the fermentation wasn't so good. And having made my own bread a lot in years past, when the fermentation isn't everything it should be, and you make that big round loaf, even if you bake it as much as it needs to be baked, it has a kind of a raw taste. And that raw taste only goes away after 24 hours. And I actually, my, I've never read this anywhere else, but, <clears throat> or heard this, but, my personal view is, is that, that part of the reason they waited was the bread didn't taste very good the first day. Yes? I can ask a question. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, the concept of foods that are good for you. That's, you know, everybody I, talks about. I, 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 I do. <laughs> but they won't be very interesting. My thoughts are these. Um, you can't know about everything. <laughs> and, and that's an area that I let myself free from knowing about. I've always said to myself that my readers are so smart they can figure it out for themselves. Um, it's it's ever-changing. They're one of the few people who tries to span the, the, the political health taste um, topics is Mark Bittman at the Times, and I would argue he, he doesn't do taste very well. So, so that's what I have to say, I'm sorry. It's not, you know, coincidentally, things that are fresh and delicious tend to be good for you. Um, I, I also think, um, and I had an exchange uh, in the last few weeks with Marian Nessel, do you know who she is at NYU, who's one of the big people about food and politics and health and nutrition. Um, I've always suspected that when you eat food that tastes better, you don't need to, you're not driven to overeat. She is very skeptical of that, and she put me in touch with one of her colleagues who's even more attuned to this, and, and, and he says, no, but if, you know, if you read a, you know, the, a book by Michael Moss, something like Sugar, Fat, and whatever, it was a, a bestseller of last year. Uh, um, and it's a, a, a very, very smart thing, and it was uh, one of the key chapters was in the Sunday Times, book was uh, serialized in the Sunday, Sunday Times Magazine. 
McDonald's and some you know big cola producers, fast food producers for the mass mark for the mass market, um, don't want you to be satisfied. They want you. They want things to taste good to you, but they don't want you to be satisfied because then you would stop eating and drinking. So I think <laughs> implicitly, therefore, and these are scientists and people, you know, very smart people working for these companies, working on taste, doing things um, not by guesswork, but 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 in a very organized, expensive research kind of way. Um, I think the implication of that is that when you're satisfied, logically, uh, you do eat less. Um, but nobody, the, you know, the money is not there, I guess, for that kind of research where there's plenty of money uh, in fast food to, to, to explore the opposite. Yes? Um, would you like to make a comment about fruits and spices, and do you include those in the book? Um, no, because I had to draw a line somewhere, and I drew the line that, that herbs and spices weren't food, so to speak, even though I suppose you could argue they are. Um, I think to make the 50 foods palatable, if you will, more palatable, um, and especially not the cheeses, but meats and vegetables and fish and so on, um, I think that they're key. I think. Um, you know, in, in my first book, I had a chapter on, on labiate herbs, the, the, uh, the broad mint family. Um, I think, what would I say that's useful in, in, in summarizing? Um, I think you really have to know them. I think it helps, especially if you live up here, you can grow them. You can really have a sense of what they are. Certain ones dry very well, like rosemary, thyme, oregano. Re oregano is actually improved by drying, um, but many other things don't. Are, are useless, uh, dried, uh, such as basil and you know, mint dries well. Certain others don't. Um, you can do very interesting things too. I, um, we have really good, a, a small number of really good strawberries last summer, and I put um, lemon verbena on them, just a, a small amount. I, I don't know, even know why I did it, except I had both of them and I thought I'd try it, and it was remarkably good. I mean, there, you make these, you know, other people surely know about that, but you make you make these little discoveries. I think that in terms of, of satisfaction and you know whatever, the excitement of tasting things, I think they're hugely important. I particularly like Greek sage from Greece. You know, they, they, um, they grow sage and, and thyme and certain things grow wild in Greece and somehow that wild stuff that is gathered in, and sold in Greek markets to me is really, really good, particularly the sage. I've never had anything like it. It bears no relationship to anything I can grow. Uh, and the thyme is very good. Um, I had wonderful thyme flowers that I was using last night that were just incredible. And those actually came from um, some people doing a business in London. And they're, they're, they're going around to different locations and they're labeling the, where the oregano and the thyme and the sage come from by location, like from the name of the island or whatever. Um, it, it, make, it does make a huge, it makes a huge difference. It's hugely fun. I'm not sure if you want if you want to guide me any more specifically. I can no. Yeah. I understand your book went from apples to walnuts. Don't forget you said about apples. Yeah, actually, it goes from anchovies, <laughs> um, which was a, a debate about apples. Um, I'm a huge apple fan. I, um, once upon a time, I lived in Sutton and amidst ten old apple trees, um, some of which I knew what what they were. They were you know Wolf River and Duchess and and wealthy, and yellow transparent. Um, I think, I mean, I have a taste probably the way you do, most people in this room do, living up here for tart apples, probably for tart fruits in general. If you start reading about uh, fruits in California and what people like, they, 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 they're, they have a mistrust of acidity. And I remember one time um, I was living in Vermont and uh, the father of a friend of mine came in and he was actually the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. But I say this because he was such a macho military guy that I gave him a glass of cider and I said something like, I meant to say this isn't one of those really tart ciders from unripe ap ripe apples, but he was from Virginia and he drank the cider and he just, I mean, he thought it was just about undrinkable. He completely misunderstood me as I thought I'd said this was one of the tart undrinkable ones. Um, so I, I, there are all kinds of apples. 
I'm a strong uh, partisan of the kinds of apples that grow in the Northeast. If you go to France, they, they're very fond of les golden, which are golden delicious, which are to me completely insipid and uninteresting, just like um, a red delicious. Uh, when I was writing this book, I was in touch with a guy at UVM who uh, updated me on something which I had heard in years past, and he sent me the, you know, the footnoted scientific stuff for it. But I wanted to know whether Macintosh were better from the Champlain Valley, meaning both, both sides of, 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 the, of the lake. And the answer was definitely yes. Now, I wish I had, just before I spoke, I wish I'd reread what, exactly what it was. Part of it is air drain. If you can get good air drain, you know, frost, come in, in other places, and, and, and just general coolness. It's the combination of the cool nights, uh, the, the day-night temperatures, I think, in October as things ripen, and then there's all, there are also particular soils. Um, so uh, Macintosh from this part of the world are definitely better, better than from other parts of the world. I mean, if you want big, big picture thoughts about apples, and this is probably not in the book, um, but if you don't have refrigeration, if you don't have controlled atmosphere storing, storage, you, you select for a completely different kind of apple. You select for a Baldwin, which will do well in storage. Uh, you know, if you want to be, have apples you know, in March, April, and, 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 and there's, I, think, I think traditionally there was about, um, in, in places, and this is maybe particularly in England more than, than here, but here too, I guess, there was about a month when you, I think you couldn't have any apple at all. Um, but. But those apples, I don't think, were as good. And I, I mean, Baldwin's, Baldwin's uh, were wiped out because of a frost in, in, I'm trying to remember when, about the 1870s, maybe, that, they were, they, that, that bat largely um, wiped out Baldwin's as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the dominant commercial crop. But I think they would have gone anyway, because I don't think it's as tasty an apple. And there was a whole group of apples that, that did not fare well in the supermarket and were sold for years and years. Rome Beauty would be one from, you know, should have been a New York State apple for sure. Um, I'm trying to think of others. I, you know, the, the Stamen, Stamen Wine Sap would be another one. And so now there, there are these um, much more, I don't want to say taste tested, but it's kind of it. There are apples in the supermarket that survive much better, that tend to have a crunch, um, uh, honey crisp, um, which I don't think is a great apple. Uh, Gala, uh, Braeburn, and I'm not sure these are these these are great apples either. But rather than having to survive uh, without mechanical refrigeration, without controlled atmosphere storage, they have to survive abuse in in transit and um, and a, and a lack of refrigeration, uh, a lack of coldness, which you would have had in a cellar before. Um, there's you know there's a whole group of English apples which have spicy flavors. Um, Cox's orange pip pippin, which I guess is almost never picked properly ripe, so it doesn't have its characteristic flavor. But um, but 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 others, there's there's a whole realm of, of of apple which we haven't seen so much of here, but are beginning to be planted here. I don't think Ashmead's kernel ever has that spiciness, but that's one of the the English apples which are um, kind of popular in, in orchards that are trying to find more of a niche. Does that begin to? You know? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I think those were were um, seed, seed wild seedlings. Yes. I have two questions. The first one is a short answer. How many pages is your olive oil chapter? <laughs> it's one of the longer ones, but you know it's alphabetical. I could quick. It's one of the longer ones because there's a lot. You know, olive oil likes. Well, like so many topics, there's just an enormous amount to say. On the other hand, it's not a North American. Okay, so what is this? One, two, so two sixty-one. No, there's only about a dozen pages, but but some of them are just a few pages, three or four. What do you have in your book? Apples, pears, strawberries, um, cantaloupe. You think I would know, right? Um, <clears throat> lemons. Plums. That's it. You know, I drift. I drifted into it. I, I. I. think that what I do involves all these things that I'm very interested in, which would be gardening, farming, nature, typography, writing. Um, I also think I particularly enjoy interviewing people. So there's this whole passel of things that came together, but I never could have envisioned it. I. You know, I, I did carpentry and house building very in a very unlucrative fashion for a number of years. So, um, goodness knows quite how I got lucky. Yes. 
movement? Hopeful? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I don't think we know how far it's going to go even. I think it, um, a few years back, I remember talking about it with somebody around here, and <clears throat> it seemed like the most cutting edge thing that nobody was yet talking about. And then, I don't know, six months later, everybody was talking about it. And it's been going on for quite a while now. I, I, I think what's hugely important for the local board movement is farmers' markets, because people get out and they see the food and they get more excited about it. Um, but it, I think it addresses a lot of things, in, in, including people I think have now an enormous mistrust of the industrialized foods that come into the supermarket, as well they should. Um, and you have a sense, you have a little, if you're choosing local foods, you have a little more control over what you're eating. And they're more delicious, not always, but, but more often than not. Uh, they they're certainly ought to be fresher. Um, there's a lot more variety of taste too when you talk about you know people raising heirloom uh, breeds of pigs and that kind of thing and and doing it in ways that are more conducive to, to better taste. I think um, you know I always talk about taste and then I worry about it's self indulgent and you know it's it's at odds with my somewhat Puritan upbringing, but taste taste. Taste drives everything. <clears throat> you know, I mean, you think about French wine. Well, most French wine is plonk. Most French wine is not good, and most French don't know that much about wine. But the wines at the very top that set the reputation are sort of the engine that pulls the whole train. And the same thing, I think, is true of, of other kinds of things. It's true of, you know, famous cheeses. Um, and, and that pulls along even, you know, craft slices in the plastic, probably. Um, I think that. Uh, that, that there's a way in, in, in which local food is, is pulling upward the quality of food in general. I do think it's a very complicated thing, though. I, I'm not overall, I, I don't know how optimistic I am overall, because at the same time, there are all these forces to produce food more and more cheaply. And as you probably all know, um, the cost uh, in environment and health are never passed on to the consumer and, um, directly in prices at the store and the company who produces doesn't pay. Um, there are a lot of forces that, that are not very happy to think about. And I think that one of the things that's happened is <clears throat> the food supply has split more than it ever was. I mean, there's always some fancy gourmet food and there's always some cheap, bad food. Um, but I think more than ever things, most food when I was growing up was in the supermarket, it was all kind of the same in terms of quality. If you went from one supermarket to another, there weren't like high-end supermarkets and low-end supermarkets, there were just supermarkets. <clears throat> now I think there are clearer streams within, and I think it's more fractured than it used to be in that, in that way. And you talked about the, the dairy in Vermont, but really it's, it's much more diversified now with different types of food. And that, in my sense, that's a hopeful sign. No, I, yeah, I mean, you know, you could argue dairy was a monoculture. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I guess I, guess I would just leave it at that. I was, I was going to think of reasons that it wasn't as bad as some things. But, mono, yeah, monoculture is, is, is not good. It's better, it's better to, to mix things up. Yes? <clears throat> I read a, a book last year called Extra Virginity. <laughs> is this about olive oil? It is. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really quite depressing. I, uh, I read reviews of the book. I, I, and, and he had, um, the same guy uh, had a piece probably taken from that book that was serialized in The New Yorker. And a lot of us were, who knew something about olive oil didn't think it was as newsy as the writer thought it was. As newsy? Yeah, yeah, as as uh, ex as much of an expose as he did. Well, my question is, you know, I've got a whole bunch of different types of olive oil, uh, ranging in prices up up and down the scale, uh, and I'm wondering, they all make the same claim to be extra virgin and to have one country of origin. Yeah. Sometimes it's Turkey. Yeah. You know. Well, the reason they claim to have one country of origin is because people were producing olive oil in Spain or North Africa or Greece and shipping it to Italy, and then it was getting a label of be produced in Italy and was getting a higher price. Well, do you think these labels are, are valid? Do I, do I trust them? Yeah. 
I think, you know, it's like what Elliot Coleman used to say about organic back in the days when there wasn't uh, yet certification, and of course he still doesn't want to be certified, um, which I very much respect. You know, he said, how do you know it's organic? You know, you know the first name of the farmer, basically, <laughs> which isn't easy, you can't, you're not probably gonna be able to do that if you're in a big city, but around here I think you, you, you know people. Well, a little bit the same thing uh, applies with olive oil. There, if, especially if you're gonna spend a little more money, there are producers that are known to be good, you know, the, the people themselves are decent and the, and the olive oil is good. I think that that's the best way to go. It's not, it's not a very user-friendly way to go because like how do you know which ones are good? Um, I think that, yeah, I mean it depends where, you know, where, where you're buying it too. I mean the, the, it's enormously important how fresh it is. If it's if it's not fresh, the, you know, it's it has its benefits of of taste and health are much much less. So, you know, the shorter the pipeline, the better. If I buy a bottle of uh, extra virgin olive oil and it has a pretty high smoke point, mm -hmm. would you die with its authenticity? Be because you're saying a refined oil would have a higher smoke point. Uh, no, because yeah, I'm just a, a, a better. I found that the better olive oils I have have very low smoke points. I, I don't know why that is, Sal. I think it could be because of something to do with the way it's produced that has nothing to do with, with the amount of uh, free oleic acid, <laughs> which is the measure of, which is the key measure of extra, of extra virginity, which, which is a measurement of, of, of rancidity. In other words, um, the fresher the oil is, the, le the, least, the, least, the less it is oxidized, um, the better it will taste and the better it will be for you. So that's, that, and that begins with picking the olives without hurt, without damaging them physically, without crushing them, so preferably by hand, rushing them to the mill, not having them sit at the mill, having them pressed promptly, and not having anything bad ha happen before they're put into the bottle. Um, and, and then getting that bottle protected from, you know, Old, uh, from uh, fluorescent light and sunlight and get that to your shelf. I mean, that, the, the, those are really important var variables too. Um, and thus, I think, you know, go to a store where you think they know and care. Um, or, no, I should say. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yeah, but I, are you talking about deep frying in particular? Well, sauteing. Yeah, no, I do, yeah. I just, I, I don't like, I mean, if you see the smoke, it's not good for lots of reasons. I mean, it's not good for taste. It smokes up your house and your kitchen. Um, it, uh, it changes the oil chemically. Yes? You know, my mother cooked with a pressure cooker throughout my entire childhood. She cooked everything she possibly could in a pressure cooker. <clears throat> I used to like to eat almost everything, but I really didn't like to eat asparagus from that pressure cooker. <laughs> um, so I think that part of growing up was not pressure cooking. I, when I first was on, in my, my early adulthood, I had a pressure cooker. <clears throat> and then I realized I wasn't using it. I got rid of it. I, I, as I, I, you know, from what I know about it, mostly from outside, it's 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 a, an excellent way to cook many things. It's, um, part of it is, um, you know, speaking of the slow move, slow food movement, that for so many years, really before I knew about organic farming, um, you know, I was kind of surprised that people would say that organic farming was the best way to go. Um, you know, it's not that traditional, and mostly slow methods of food preparation were the best, and I was just always looking for mm -hmm. traditional things. And, yeah. Um, and a pressure cooker is not traditional. No, it's not. But um, a friend gave me one as a gift. And because I had one as a younger person, and I never used it because I just was terrified. <laughs> but, um, part of what, you know, it's the, there's a modernization, and it's just the, the era of technology and those kinds of tools that are available for transforming mm -hmm. food, but also in the philosophy, at least, you know, it's for more, is that 
it's really European. It's about saving energy, and it's also about reducing time of cooking. And so there's mm -hmm. this idea that in one part, your food potentially can be fresher with time in the shorter cooking periods, but also mm -hmm. you spend less time, and so for many people, it's accessible to go to the kitchen yeah. and have something. Yeah. But part of me is still not totally in favor of this well, approach. I, I have Two things to say, neither of which probably will help very much at all, but <clears throat> I like to see food as, as, it, as it's being transformed. I mean, certainly there are traditional ways of, you know, sealing with bread dough, uh, you know, a braised meat in a pot, but but generally you, you had access, and I like to watch the transformation. It also makes me think, it, and you, it's just, you know, it's just a, a point of comparison, uh, what's traditional and what you have to honor. Patience Gray, when a young British food writer she knew, wrote about making um, polenta by first mixing the, the cornmeal with cold water and starting in cold water, was outraged. It was dishonor to all the generations of women who made polenta by sifting it in while, while stirring. You know, she just, I mean, she, she, it, was, it was beyond anything that she could imagine that anyone would possibly want to do that. So, but I, I, I think there are lots of ways. There, there are different paths, and there, there's not, perfection is elusive. <laughs> yes? I hope to give more than a nod to um, onion, garlic. There's, they're not in there. And the reason, <laughs> I know, and they, I think they probably, when I was, the reason they're not in there, is because I thought I have nothing more to say about garlic that hasn't everyone hasn't already said, and I don't really think everything to say about onions either. But they, you know, as part of the foundation, they should really be in there. I think by the time I was committed to these fifty foods and the manuscript was that far along, I didn't realize I was going to have to defend my choices quite so much. <laughs> <laughs> you could easily write another book of 50 foods, though I do think certain things would get repetitive. I mean, if you went to the 100 foods, for instance, when, when you've talked about several kinds of meat, I and mean, you don't need to talk about additional kinds of meat, I think you can extrapolate. Uh, and, and that may be less true of certain fruits where things are more individual. But I think you would have a hard time writing about 100 foods and, and making it really a, an interesting read for all of them. But yes, onions should be there, 51. <laughs> yes? What are, you, what are you curious about now? Where do you see yourself drawn? <laughs> well, you know, one of the observations somebody made that I thought was very good is there's, there's really not much in the way that's of tropical food. I think lemons are about the closest thing to a tropical food, and they're not really tropical. <clears throat> so I think, I mean, there are things that I've always wanted to do that I'm probably going to do. I, I've never really written about Rhone wines, for instance, Syrah in France. So I'm probably want to do that. But that's not probably what you're asking. Um, I think I would like to digest and think about the things that I haven't done, and maybe, I don't know, just for fun, write about something tropical or something just completely different from what I've done before, or, or else I, 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 have, I, have, I have somebody's autobiography I want to write, but that's a different topic entirely. <laughs> Is there one more question that has to be asked? Yes. Have you ever been to Asia? No, I've never been to Asia. It's a Western book, and that's so I need to write about tropical food in Asia. <laughs> there are many, many delicious food in Asia. I do. And the Chinese restaurant here, I have to say, the food here is Americanized. <laughs> I don't believe that. I think we know that, most of us. But it's a good point. Thank you. Well, thank you all.